As often happens, the crypto industry has found itself in a pickle, trying to differentiate between what an algorithmic stablecoin is and what a truly fully backed collateral stablecoin is. We have a problem with getting our definitions right and delivering that message to regulators. Well, Jeremy Allaire, the CEO of Circle, came to set the record straight and talk about why fully backed collateralized stablecoins like USDC are superior and what that looks like moving forward. This is a conversation you do not want to miss. Obviously, the talk of the town has been stablecoin, certainly in light of the term algorithmic stablecoin, which I would say is a horrible misnomer and needs to be eliminated immediately. But do you think that it's unfair to even call these sort of competitors stablecoins? Yeah, it's really funny. And, and Scott, thanks, thanks for having me on the show. Um, it, like the whole word stablecoin, um, that was not something that we chose. That chose us, uh, wh whether, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, back in 2017, when we first actually published the first white paper um, outlining what we were hoping to do uh, ar around the, this space, um, you know, we, we, we used the term fiat token, uh, which is a lot less glamorous, or I don't know, it's just different. <laughs> um, but the concept was like, hey, we can tokenize fiat currency. And, and that has a different meaning, right? If you're, if you're tokenizing fiat currency, well, what is fiat currency? Well, it's liabilities of central banks. It's government debt, like treasury bonds. It's sort of what, what, what do we really mean when we get beneath the surface? Something that purports to represent a dollar, but in fact is, uh, you know, a bunch of crypto collateral or is, uh, you, know, you know, maybe it's a, a mixture of, 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 of commercial loans and other things. Um, there's huge differences. And so um, you know, we've been hammering for the last year, year and a half, not all stable coins are created equal. Um, and now, you know, really recently it's been, you know, kind of, you know, uh, how to be stable. What is stability? What does that really mean? And, and, and getting to the essence and the heart of um, how do you maintain dollar for dollar liquidity and what's the right regulatory framework for that? And, and everyone's sort of feeling around a lot of issues, but I, you know, look at a, at a high level, if you go across our website, it's very infrequent that you'll find the word stablecoin. You'll, you'll see that we talk about USDC as a dollar digital currency. And, you know, just like there'll be Euro digital currencies and yen digital currencies, we have a dollar digital currency, which is USDC. I think we have a huge problem in our industry in general with our vernacular and verbiage. I mean, I hate the term cryptocurrency to be quite frank, because 99% of them are not even right. attempting to be currencies, algorithmic stablecoin, as you said, even the term stablecoin, right? And so I think, I don't know if I, the crypto industry needs better PR, but I think we certainly need better wording. Yeah, no, I, I mean, look, some of this is just going to come from the industry and users and how we describe things. Some of it might end up being statutory. There might be statutes that define the different types of crypto assets and, you know, what, you know, there's, there's something that really is a currency. There's something that's a commodity. There's something that um, is, uh, is more like a, uh, an investment contract or whatever. There's like lots of different ways to think about it from a, from a, <clears throat> a, a definitional perspective for sure. And, um, but, you know, here we are and people are, are, are talking about these as dollar stable coins and, um, and certainly we will keep hammering the differences uh, and, and what's really important really at the end of the day for users in the market to kind of know what they're dealing with. Well, I think transparency is obviously essential and important, but there has been a challenge, I think, in this industry. Jeff Dorman from ARCA actually recently pointed it out. He somewhat said, we demand transparency, but then if you're Luna or a Celsius, whales can attack that transparency and effectively liquidate your assets and make you insolvent because you've now shown them exactly where your attack vectors are. It's a challenge. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think... Um, um, there's a, you know, there, 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 are, there are reasons why there are, um, you know, registration rules, investor protection rules, market conduct rules, market surveillance rules, consumer protection rules, anti-competitive rules. There's a reason for that um, because, um, you know, people get hurt, people lose money. It can be extraordinary what, what happens. And so I think we're in an environment where crypto is going to be held to a higher standard. Um, and obviously, you know, Bitcoin is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is, is, it is just what it is. But 
the way in which market conduct happens on different things and all these things, right? That things need to be held to a higher standard. Um, and I think that's very self-evident to anyone who's on the outside looking in. Um, I think when you're on the inside looking out, I think, um, you know, I, I think people are, are, are increasingly just kind of coming to grips with that, uh, you know, more and more. Um, but, um, you know, it's interesting. There's, there's a reason why, you know, USDC, you know, has, has, is like the, the most, you know, it's actually the most redeemed, uh, you know, stable coin, um, you, you know, really ever, ever built. Um, and that's because everyone understands that, you know, USDC is always held in reserve as a dollar in a dollar liquid asset under a regulatory framework that, that defines it. There's, so there's no, there's not like an ARB there or something to attack there. Right. Um, unless you're going to attack the T-bill market. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, you, you know, that would be, uh, you know, economic warfare between say China and the U S or something like that. But, you know, we've, we've redeemed and people focus a lot on like, is it liquid? Is it redeemable? We've redeemed over the last 12 months, 108 billion USDC. Um, that's because it's liquid and always redeemable. And because it's always redeemable and you always get a dollar, that's why it's always held to a dollar. Is there any level at which it could mimic a bank run? I know the answer, but I'm going to give you an answer, <laughs> the opportunity to uh, say it anyways. No, I mean, the, the, this, is, this is the, I think the, the thing that people have to understand. Banks take your dollars and then they say, hey, I have an IOU. I owe you a dollar. Your balance, your demand deposit account, your balance is an IOU. But then what the banks do is they take your money and they invest it. They invested in automotive loans. They invested in mortgages. They invested in commercial loans. They invested in whatever the heck their proprietary you know, investing group wants to do. And, so they, and they do that on a leveraged basis, on typically like an eight to one leverage ratio. That's what a bank is. That's what you're investing in. So yes, there can be runs on banks because they don't actually have the money. They have, they have essentially, you know, eight to one leverage and, you know, in a, in a severe economic environment, right? That's why you have these mutualized insurance products like FDIC to backstop that risk. But nonetheless, that's the case. In the case of USDC, it's cash and it's, nine, you know, th uh, sorry, three month US treasury bonds, right? So always you know us treasury bonds are the most liquid financial instrument in the world the the the, the three month treasury you know us treasuries that is even safer than a, a deposit in a bank because a deposit in a bank you're you're kind of taking the risk the underlying risk there and so it's it's, it's structurally very very different and we'd like to make it even even safer over time we'd like to have the cash parked at the fed um, and so you got a cash at the fed and you've got basically short term government debt and that gives you something that is as close to a cash or cash equivalent that you can get that's imaginable, but it has, you know, internet superpowers because it's operating as a digital currency on a blockchain. What steps would be necessary to actually be able to park the reserves at the Fed? You know, we have, um, we have signaled our intention to, uh, you know, to, to operate under some national regulatory framework for stable coins. There's a lot of congressional work that's happening around that. Um, and there are discussions around that. The OCC, which regulates national banks and thrifts and trusts and financial institutions, is looking really closely at this. We've got great engagement there. And so our hope is that, um, you know, there is a future structure where um, we have the ability to have the cash uh, at, at the Fed. And, and I think there are multiple avenues uh, to achieving that over time. It's, it's interesting because I think in our industry, we keep hearing SEC, CFTC, right? Sort of consumer facing regulators, but really isn't the end game here, the FDIC, the Fed, the OCC, the bank regulators, as you're talking about. I mean, the, the single probably largest choke point in theory for the crypto industry is banking access, right? In yeah. general. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, there's a phrase, all roads lead to the Fed, <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> I think, um, uh, you know, when, when you're talking about you know, representations of, of government debt money, which is what fiat is, what a dollar is, it's sort of a, it is a form of government debt money, representations of government debt money, um, you know, those and, and, the, and the payment systems and essentially the, the systems of, of, of technology that express that in electronic form that enable it as a medium of exchange, that is supervised by what are 
often referred to as prudential regulators. They're looking at the fundamental risk of the monetary system and the financial system. Those are the prudential regulators. Those are not capital markets regulators. Those are the, the, kind, of, the, the kind of core money systems regulators. And I think with something in particular like um, stable coins of the ilk, like USDC, that's really where that fits. And it's and that's sort of what's happening. If you look at the legislative, you know, kind of regulatory proposals coming out of Congress, they're all focused on having it be kind of regulated in that space. Same thing in the UK, same thing in the EU, same thing in, in many, many other markets in the world, what just came out of the, the you know, the, the financial regulators in Japan, you know, and so I think there's kind of a consensus view around this, uh, that, that that's the case. But of course, in, in, in crypto as a whole, there are absolutely market markets issues. There are, you know, exchanges and different types of assets and investor protection issues and, you know, market manipulation issues and insider trading issues and all these sort of things that markets regulators have worked on for a very long time. And, and you see that, you know, whether it be Coinbase or FTX or others who are super, super active in the U.S. regulatory dialogue are really advocating for market regulators to have a regime around crypto exchanges in the U.S., for sure. Yeah, I mean, markets hate uncertainty. And so I think that everyone would almost prefer bad clarity to no clarity at this point. It seems like the industry, yeah. and obviously they're pushing towards the CFTC as potentially a more friendly regulator to, to get that done. Yep. But I mean, I think a lot of people are just waiting to be told what they can't do so that they can operate at all. Yeah, and, and that's... that's uh... That's the, 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 the tricky thing is like uh, no, no one wants to spell it out, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, the, and, and that uncertainty is, is, uh, is, is really challenging. You know, obviously, when you've got, you know, um, you know, issues where various products and services sort of blow up, um, then that obviously creates an impetus for, uh, for, for regulators to sort of say, hey, look, we got to draw some lines here. Um, and and take action, and so obviously we're seeing that, and and um, you know you, you, one could argue that that's a healthy thing, um, yeah. th th to to a large degree, right? Um, if if in the end what you end up with is you know some precedent and or de facto uh, kind of kind of uh, uh, frameworks, um, that that could end up being being a healthy thing. Yeah, you you certainly hate seeing the self inflicted wounds and seeing sort of the ammunition being handed to the regulators right at a time when perhaps they were actually starting to look favorably at the industry. But in the end, I mean, not selfishly, but for you, that should push most of the interests and favorable regulation in your direction. Well, look, I mean, we've always, you know, I, I started Circle um, nine years ago. And uh, my, my co-founder and I back in, in, you know, we were getting started nine years ago and um, we always knew, and I always knew that we had to always work, you know, go in through the front door, as I like to say, and, and, you know, be open and educate policymakers and regulators, just do, do that. There's nothing to hide here. It's like, here's the innovation. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what the risks are. Here's how we're managing it. Here, you know, here's how we interpret the law as it stands today and how we're going to be compliant in that and, and sort of working to do that. And so we've been doing that for nine years. I testified to the U.S. Senate nine years ago in November. Um, and so it's just been it's been something that's there. And I think, um, uh, you know, at the same time, we've always tried to be really, really innovative and, and advancing what what's possible, um, even where there isn't total regulatory clarity, because that's where innovation comes from, right? You, 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 you innovate in gray areas and, and eventually things get big enough that, they, that there's more of a perimeter that gets defined. Um, and so I think that you're right, just that the, the, the approach of, of, of trying to kind of do things the right way in that sense um, will be important. Again, that kind of concept of like crypto held to a higher standard, I think is really important. But there is a lot to do that just has nothing to do with regulators. There's just so much that the industry needs to do itself. And there's so much sort of self-policing and there's so much more like accountability. And I think there's a lot of looking oneself in the mirror uh, that needs to happen uh, as well, because I think in a bull market, it's really easy to sort of believe, believe the hype on, on any which way, you know, on anything, any which way. Um, but I think, you know, um, you know, things like, you know, kind of people just wanted to believe the financial alchemy of, of, of Terra Luna UST. They just wanted to believe it. They wanted to believe like this time it's different. This is something. But if you anyone with reasonable analysis could just look at it and say this thing is set up to collapse, but people just wanted to believe. 
Um, and so I think for, for people that wanted to believe, um, you know, they, they got to really get underneath their assumptions and, and, and their cognitive biases and other things and, and, and try and uh, you know, better understand that. That's kind of self-policing in a sense. Yeah. What's sad though, is it's, you know, when you say that it feels like it was just retail that wanted to believe, but they were, I think that Luna was okay. largely empowered by some of the biggest names and some of the biggest funds. And when you see those names and funds tacitly supporting it and right. throwing their money into it, how can you as Right. Maybe even a sophisticated retail investor who would dig in, but non sophisticated re re investor certainly. How could you be expected to not go look if they're doing it? It must be safe. Right. It must be secure. There must be something behind this. Yeah. No. I. 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 I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, so um, you know that that whole affair will get litigated over time, and we'll we'll uh, we'll see where things end up. Oh, the, the good news is that there was actually minimal contagion from it. And I think it sort of passed in a uh, in less of a hurricane than we expected after it's probably not even worth talking to death yeah, sure, at this sure. point. And I think what is, is the fact that now it seems that we have at least some legislators who are very clearly making the distinction between what a true fully backed collateralized stable coin is and everything else. Um, yeah. Do you think that, Listen, that's what I hear because I'm deep down this rabbit hole. So, of course, I hear the Lummises and the Gillibrands and the Toomeys who are saying these things. Yeah. Do you think that there's a wider spread understanding of that or at least a willingness for other legislators to dig in and, yeah. and, and learn? I, I think there is. I mean, I, I think there is a wider spread understanding. And I think, you know, we've been doing the hard work for a while. And, and this is sort of, you know, first just getting the media who covers this space to kind of be able to differentiate. And, and that's been a, a battle, but, but one which I think we've, we've largely won. It's been getting, you know, top participants in the financial system to acknowledge that. And so, you know, kind of hearing positive comments from the head of the IMF at Davos, hearing positive comments about stablecoins done behind. the right way from Chairman Powell, from Secretary Yellen, you know, hear, hearing those things publicly in public testimony is really, I think, um, an indicator that you know people are hearing that. If 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 I'm a member of Congress and I've got Secretary Yellen or Chairman Powell saying, "Look, there are innovative private sector stablecoin models that work." Yeah, we we might need to define some more rules around it, um, which which you know d deals with tail risk and 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 other things. But still, acknowledging it, I think, is a really big deal, and you're certainly seeing more of that. But you know, on a on a grand scale, right? You might have the the as some of the names that you mentioned who are you know active in the legislation legislative process right but of the hundreds of members of, of of Congress the many hundreds of members of Congress the number who've actually got a, an understanding and can differentiate that is, is probably quite small it's probably you know in in the in the maybe a, a few dozen and so there's a lot of work to do still and if there is going to be legislation and it is going to be sane and and reasonable. Um, we need everybody to understand this. The IMF comment blew my mind. That was the most out of left field that I've heard because obviously they've been extremely, I'll say the nice word, skeptical of the El Salvador experiment. Uh, they openly pushed back against Argentina who was moving in a favorable crypto direction you know, and said, basically yeah. you can't do that if we're gonna offer a loan. Do you think that's because this is a dollar product and, and not necessarily a Bitcoin product. So the IMF would be, or these organizations would be more likely to support something yeah. that obviously spreads the dollar. You know, it's really interesting. It, you know, the IMF has done a lot of publishing on digital currency um, over, over the past several years. And I think um, they've been, you know, looking at stable coins. And in fact, you know, the first G7 report on stable coins was co-authored by one of the key, key, key people at the IMF. And, um, and they published a lot. And I think their vantage point has been, hey, the stable coins could actually kind of um, kind of meet uh, 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 a kind of what sometimes is referred to as synthetic CBDC, um, uh, which is also an extension of this former concept of a narrow bank. But this idea that you could have a, uh, a, a nationally chartered financial institution that has a narrow charter, which is basically to hold stable reserves and then enable a very low cost frictionless payment system built on top of it. And, and that's the sort of synthetic CBDC, the concept being, hey, if it's got the same 
kind of characteristics as as central bank M1 money, like you know, which is sort of the dollar electronic records of the Fed or 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 government bonds, you know, short-term government bonds. If you have that kind of form of money and you can operationalize it as a digital currency and run on the internet and get all the efficiencies of that and the openness and interoperability and global reach, like that would be really powerful. So they've actually advocated for that. They've actually advocated for that as a, a more likely path to lead to innovation and financial inclusion than central bank digital currency models. And so it's interesting. They, they've been they've been sort of, I think, out in front on this. That's different than their point of view about countries adopting Bitcoin. And I think, um, which, which I think they're, they're, they're quite um, negative about. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's interesting too. I mean, I think you're starting to hear people, including folks at the IMF, begin to think about the monetary sovereignty implications of, uh, of digital currency. And, you know, the, the, the fact that a dollar digital currency like USDC can kind of exist everywhere. The internet exists and people can use it around the world. And there's sort of money substitutes and what happens with that and, and what happens to economic policy and fiscal policy and monetary policy in different parts of the world. That's already been an issue with dollarization as a, as a general theme and sort of what happens if that gets on steroids because of this, the frictionlessness of the internet. And so that's raising broader political and economic questions that I think um, need to be grappled with because you know I, I think in the end, maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, pick your time frame, like, the world doesn't need 190 currencies, um, and 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 you know society, you know households and firms are going to vote with their internet connections what economic system they want to participate in, and they they just will just like they vote with what communication system they choose to use you know WhatsApp or they choose to use you know Signal or they choose to use email or they're, they're choosing these mediums that are built in software and protocols and the internet. And that's happening with the economic system, the monetary system. And that is just gonna pose really major issues for governments. Um, and the, you know, so this has to be grappled with clearly. Everybody knows that there are advantages to trading on both centralized and decentralized exchanges, but why not choose an exchange like Bullish that offers the best of both worlds? Bullish's total trading volume recently exceeded $25 billion in just seven months since they launched and they have the best liquidity in the game when it comes to Bitcoin USD. Now, Bullish has released the first major upgrade to its liquidity pool technology with the introduction of a concentrated range-bound liquidity pool for the Bitcoin USD trading pair. This upgrade triples the order book depth within a range of 2%, making it one of the world's deepest Bitcoin USD trading pairs. This industry-leading order depth means you can trade confidently at scale with clearly understood price impact. You should check them out immediately at bullish.com slash Melker. Yeah, I, I, listen, I'm a Bitcoiner. So of course I believe that Bitcoin's great store of value is a great medium of exchange, Absolutely. especially for people in these places. But- And I, I, I'm totally I know, on this. And I know you agree, but at a granular level and something that people are starting to talk about more is that most people in the world who are unbanked and underbanked actually want access to dollars. Right. Right. That's the thing that there is a dearth of. That's the thing that yeah. they can't get at a bank. That's the thing that is way better than the Bolivar yeah. or their peso yeah. or whatever hyperinflating yeah. currency that they have. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't transfer it into Bitcoin, but anecdotally, you know, we have friends in Venezuela that we've sent Bitcoin over the years to help them. Yeah. There became a point where they said, how about stable coins? Yeah. <laughs> Send right. us dollars. Right. And that's right. the way that, right. Yeah, and, and so I think, you know, I think one of the things that's important in this in this market, and, and, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, is you, you have to kind of zoom out and take some perspective over over t different time frames. And I remember really well, you know, when the when the um, I don't know if you remember the block size debates uh, that were happening. And of course, it's hard not to remember them, but the, the, the block size debates and it really brought to bear this big debate over is Bitcoin really meant to be like a utility for payments and scaling, or is it really meant to be this digital gold and this store of value, which eventually over the long run, once the monetary base is large enough in the many, many, many trillions of dollars of value where it, and, 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 and sort of, you know, mining is done and you're, you're sort of in that transactional mode where it becomes more of a unit of account. And, and I think, you know, there, there's there, there's one. If you take a very long term view, I think that's right, um, and I think there's good arguments to say a, a a a monetary unit like that could could become more important as a unit of account um, in, in the future. Um, 
And so I think for some people, it's sort of like, hey, I need I need an everyday medium of exchange that is sort of relatively price stable and um, and that is w- widely accepted and understood uh, around the world. And then I need kind of short term savings instruments, which maybe can predictably you know, give me you know, protect me from the short term inflation and or, or maybe, you know, slightly exceed it. And then I need long term savings. I need ways to sort of say, hey, I'm 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 taking a view over the long term value and store of value and, and, and doing that. And and I think there's different crypto assets for all of those scenarios, D- different, you know, whether it's a stable coin, uh, you know, uh, or, or a DeFi protocol that one uses or a crypto commodity or something like Bitcoin itself. You said crypto assets. That's the term I would like to replace cryptocurrencies yeah. with, by the way. Yeah. Everyone says digital assets, but then I'm like, what about our MP3s? You know, um, exactly. and so, yeah I, yeah, I really like crypto assets as the term. And so have you actually, uh, do you have data or have you seen anecdotally support of the idea that I just presented that you're seeing increased adoption on the ground in countries with hyperinflation or with, you know, a, a, a mass of the population un- underbanked? Yeah, I mean, we've been seeing really for the past two plus years, we've been seeing consistent demand for USDC in in emerging markets, um, and and I think um, that has uh, you know gr- grown um, in in some ways. Right, the the pandemic caused more fiscal and monetary instability in more places, um, and and one could argue fiscal and monetary instability here in the United States. Um, but you know, it, it, it's 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 had that effect. And so corresponding to that has been this kind of rise in demand for um, things like uh, USDC. So we've definitely seen that. Um, and, and I would say that's accelerating. That activity is accelerating. So many startups we're seeing, so many companies building connectivity with USDC in, you know, in, in, in markets around the world. And it reflects that. It reflects that kind of organic demand uh, that, that's there. That, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It aligns with what I would expect it, obviously, to be. Now, interestingly, at Circle, you guys have a yield product, right? Yep. Uh, I believe the rates are in the mid 4%, depending on how yep. long. How, how, how are you able to, you're obviously talking to regulators and legislators. A similar project product was actually presented to the SEC by Coinbase, which was dismissed outright. Yeah. Actually, with the threat of uh, litigation, I think. Um, right. How, how are you able to offer those which I believe for this space, especially very reasonable yields. Yeah. So, you know, um, as, as you know, um, there, there's a, a, a large market for people who want to borrow stable coins like USDC. And so there's a borrowing market, there's a borrowing and lending market. And um, that borrowing market, um, there's an institutional borrowing market and it's sophisticated institutions um, that are that are you know um, at scale generally who want to borrow USDC or borrow other 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 uh, you know other stable coins, but USDC is is one of the most popular that people want to borrow, and those borrowers are willing to borrow at reasonable interest rates. You know you know four or five, six, seven, eight, even ten percent. Right, um, that's sort of the cost of capital to borrow. If, if I was a business. I'm a, say I'm a I'm a I'm a, a financial business or a non-financial business, and I go to a, a bank just in the traditional sense and say I want to borrow capital. I want to work in capital line, right? You might get a you know seven percent, eight percent, ten percent, twelve percent interest rate. If I'm a consumer and I go and to a to a bank and say I want to borrow, you know, well they have a they have a credit line. It's called a credit card, and you can borrow up to say fifty thousand dollars at a seventeen percent interest rate. And so there are very clearly like these dollar borrowing markets and and there are these institutional um, stablecoin borrowing markets that exist. And so what we chose to do was build a product that was um, regulated. So we sought out a regulator that would supervise a lending product, the risk management, the collateral needed, the custody, security, uh, you know, anti-money laundering, the whole thing. So we, we, we worked with the regulator. And the other was that our analysis was that to offer such a product is selling a security. It is offering a security. And so uh, Circle Yield is offered as a security and it's only offered to accredited investors. And so it's not something that's available to anyone. It's you know sophisticated institutions and accredited investors and the like. And so um, you know, there's full risk disclosures. You're purchasing a note, um, which is an investment contract. That's what you're doing when you 
when you take your USDC and you put it in your circle account and then you create a loan and you get that, that interest rate. And so we designed it compliantly. We designed it understanding it was a security. We designed it with the regulatory framework. And the entire thing is, is driven by very high quality institutional market participants. And so that's how we uh, allow it to, you know, to, to do what it does. And I think it's a very good product. And, you know, as we're seeing the products that we're out offering too good to be true, uh, you know, whether it be Anchor or Celsius or, or, or what have you, I mean, some of these are running into real challenges. Yeah, that 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 makes perfect sense. I actually wasn't aware, aware that it was securitized and only available to accredited investors. So yeah, that, yeah. That, so that puts you very safely within the framework. But it obviously begs the question, and I think everyone's assumption is, why would people borrow USDC? Is it so that they can short? I mean, look, USDC is becoming like the preferred working capital of, of, of the digital asset world, right? Whether you're a, a, a trading firm or a startup, um, how, you know, so many startups are, are actually in this space, raise their capital in USDC. Circle Ventures, we've done, you know, 70 investments and we invest using USDC. People manage their Dow treasuries using USDC. Um, and it's, it's increasingly just viewed as the kind of dollar treasury and a, and, a, and a dollar mechanism. And so to the degree that there's just working capital demand and, and working capital borrowing demand, that's there. And then similarly, institutional market participants um, who are borrowing to uh, pursue whatever particular investment strategy, um, you know, they're, they're, they're borrowing USDC because that's what you need to participate in the markets. Um, and if you're going to make an, put on an investment strategy, you're doing that with stable coins. You're not doing that with, uh, you know, uh, a traditional bank wire. Can USDC become large enough that a central bank digital currency in the United States is effectively pointless? I mean, our view is, is very much that the path towards digital dollar digital currency kind of ubiquity and, and adoption, not just in the US, but around the world is through um, well-regulated private sector market competitive forces. And that technology innovation, which is, this is very much a technology innovation um, problem um, and public internet infrastructure, which is what blockchains represent. It's a kind of public good, public internet infrastructure. That's the fastest path towards, you know, competitiveness for dollars on the internet. And, um, and if you just look at like every innovation in electronic money, whether it's the wire messaging system or, uh, you know, checks and check clearing, to the invention of the credit card, the invention of the debit card, the invention of the ATM, the invention of PayPal, and then Apple Pay, and then stable coins. These are all driven by private sector innovation, a lot of times with standardization happening around them, so de facto standards or explicit standards. And I think that's sort of what we'll see here as well. And um, you know, the central bank didn't build any of those things. Um, they really let a well-regulated private competitive market execute on that. I think that's very Western. I think that's what kind of how a lot of that's happened. There are going to be parts of the world where governments centrally manage and control things, where governments want greater surveillance. They want to be able to be uh, monitoring more of consumer behavior. They want to be able to um, eliminate private sector competition. And in markets like that, like China, that might make more sense uh, for what they're trying to achieve in an authoritarian regime. But I'm not convinced that that's the value system that people in the West really want to see. I think people want an air gap between their money, their wallet, and the government. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, a central bank digital currency in China. That's a very different proposition, <laughs> correct? I mean, with yeah, very different I mean, totally. goals and very different ambitions. That totally. Are I think the message here that we've been delivering to, to, to policymakers in D.C. is, you know, the strategy can't be to out-China China. The strategy has got to be, what are your strengths? What are your strengths? What makes the West... So amazing! It's openness, competitiveness, free markets. Uh, you know the, the 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 ability to build on this public commons and and do that, and privacy preservation. Um, these are important values, and um, and those are I think important to how you know how how these geoeconomic regions compete. Um, and this is going to be an internet scale competition. Do you think that there will be demand or popularity of? stable coins, or we'll call them fiat coins uh, for <laughs> every currency in the world, or I, it still seems that even in the crypto industry, there's very little demand even for Euro-backed coins or, or anything else. 
So, I mean, I think this idea of international stables is, is super powerful, actually. And I think in some ways, as you said, right, the, the demand in, in, in the crypto world has mostly been around dollars. Um, but I think that's really changing. And I, as you know, we just announced Eurocoin, which is a euro backed stable coin, which is going to be available, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the coming couple of weeks and which, you know, I think is going to provide the same kind of quality and the same kind of experience that people have come to expect with dollars, but with euro. And I think it's indicative of, I think, something that's happening, which is that crypto and digital currency is going to find its way into more um, payments, trade, commerce, and other applications. And it's sort of that evolution from a purely kind of speculative value phase into a utility value phase. And with that utility value phase, you know, kind of FX, trade, settlement, and commerce becomes a lot more real. And so as a result, not only are we launching Eurocoin, but we actually expect there to be real proliferation in more fiat denominated stable coins and digital currencies, because I think that that kind of real world utility is starting to come online. And so I think that's going to be something that I think is, is worth really watching closely uh, over the next couple of years. And obviously, we're excited to have the, the, the second largest uh, reserve currency in the world uh, being something that we're, we're issuing and, and making available for people to build on and use. That's really exciting. I have to imagine that uh, getting there with the regulators all over uh, <laughs> Europe would have been a challenge. So it's a pretty incredible feat, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, look, we're we're um, we're starting out um, issuing this um, out of the U out of the U.S. Uh, under the same regulatory framework that we use for USDC. And um, I, you know, I think there are there are um, legislative proposals that are um, near final in the EU, which will finally define a framework for. Um, uh, regulated stable coins in the EU, and we're super excited to obviously, uh, uh, you know, be registered and operating under that as soon as as there's clarity on what those laws are going to be. That makes sense. Speaking of clarity on laws, I, I actually had the opportunity to sit down with Kirsten Gillibrand recently, right after they announced the uh, bill, and I was really impressed, to be quite frank, at the, how thoughtful it was. I would love to hear your thoughts on the Lummis uh, Gillibrand proposal. Obviously, stable coins as they call them, being a huge part of that. Yeah, I mean, look, there's there's a lot in that bill. Um, and, and, and sort of maybe my first comment is there's a lot in that bill. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I think it, it, it is it is probably the first, you know, comprehensive um, set of, of legislative proposals that touch on many of the issues, many of the important issues, everything from, you know, tax treatment to uh, definitions of of assets to uh, you know, specificity around uh, types of, of regulators, um, stable coins, et cetera. So I think it's ambitious. Um, there's a lot that I like about it. Um, I think, um, you know, maybe kind of narrowing in for, for us, um, obviously we do care about all of those issues and, and they impact us directly or indirectly. I think the one we're most focused on is is the stablecoin policy side of it. And I think it's a pretty sound set of proposals. I mean, I think it's relatively consistent with what we saw from Senator Pat Toomey, um, who put forward a proposal. We've seen some uh, proposals come out of Democrats or both bi bipartisan uh, proposals in, in the House as well. And so I think when you kind of draw all those together and you kind of look at those and kind of break it down, we're starting to get to potentially a consensus view from both Democrats and Republicans on what stablecoin policy and regs could look like, uh, which is to have a national framework for it, to have national standards around transparency, reserves, liquidity, auditing, reporting, um, and then potentially to have, you know, a, a, a way to kind of be registered and licensed through the U.S. Treasury Department, which I think would be a really positive step and would provide a really powerful signal to the rest of the world that this is a national infrastructure uh, for how, how dollars can function uh, that that the rest of the world could depend on as well. At the very least, I find it incredibly impressive and encouraging that we have the president of the United States, you know, putting an executive order that this is now on the floor. Three or four years ago, I, I would have called you crazy if you said that in 2022, this is what we would be seeing. Totally, totally. Well, I thank you for your part in that. Obviously, you've been a huge proponent in pushing it extremely hard, and I, and you know, I can't wait to see what happens moving forward as we obviously sort of uh, gain some clarity and see what makes it and what doesn't, I guess, so to speak. So thank you very much for taking the time. Much appreciated. Absolutely. My pleasure, Scott. That's dope.